hand icon at the top. You can see at the top bar there's a smiley face and a little hand and you'll find um, a putting your hand up icon. In fact, I'll put my hand up so you can see what I mean. And that alerts us to the fact that somebody's wanting to ask a question. You can also put questions in the chat. Um, I'd also like to say just at the start of the talk, a huge thank you for your generosity in supporting the talks. We usually say this at the end, but I wanted to make sure everybody hears it um, before they log off. Um, we've been astounded by people's generosity, and I know a lot of you have been to all of these talks. Um, as you probably know, um, work's been going on at the Minster funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund for the last 18 months or so um, to repair and conserve the building and also to make some improvements to the fabric and to the grounds. Um, we've also got a fantastic community garden at the Archbishop's Palace and improvements are due to start there within the next few weeks. And the reason for saying that is to let you know what's going to happen to your generous donations for the talks. Chapter has agreed that all monies donated for the talks can be put directly towards the improvements in the garden. And that's going to be new plants, new interpretation and better accessibility, which is great news. And I just wanted to share that with you at the start. So on to today's talk, the title is Listening to the Leaves. What can the leaves of Southwell teach us? And it's given today by two of our wonderful stewards, Joanne and Janet. And it's very sad, actually, we were just chatting earlier. I haven't realised we haven't seen each other in the flesh for over a year. It's hard to believe, but it's great to see them both here. Joanne and Janet have done huge amounts of research during the development and the delivery phase of the Leaves project. And we're thrilled that they've agreed, had their arms twisted, to join us here today to talk to yeah. us. <clears throat> so pass over to you, Joanne and Janet now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Despite our very different backgrounds, Janet and I both share a love of the Minster, which we delight in sharing with others through our roles as stewards and guides. And today, despite the essential digital nature of our talks, we hope to continue to inspire and encourage visitors. There can be no doubt that the Chapter House, with its fascinating array of stone carvings, offers us a unique panoramic view of medieval England, which resonates with visitors even today, more than seven centuries later. In our talks today, Janet and I, guided by the carvings, hope to examine what they tell us about society and its environment in the 20 years from 1290 to 1310, during which the chapter house was constructed. I will focus briefly on state and church governance, religion, common misconceptions and jobs and pastimes, to gain an insight into the lives of ordinary people in those early days. Janet will focus on the natural history of the time and talk us through not only the significance of the period architecturally, but also the magnificent leaves themselves, all of which may be found today in our own gardens, fields and hedgerows. She will also examine their ancient symbolism and medicinal properties, together with suggestions as to why certain leaves were chosen to be immortalised. So please join us now as we travel back to England in the Middle Ages, a journey which we hope you will enjoy. I think it's fair to say that most people when visiting a medieval building find themselves wondering what life was like for ordinary men and women, essentially like ourselves, living in those early times, not only in the local community, but also in the country as a whole. After all, the Middle Ages was one of the most turbulent and transformative periods in our history. For the most part, the 13th century in the high medieval period 
was a time when feudalism was at its peak in England, a time which saw a huge increase in the economy. The population was growing at a tremendous rate, life expectancy was rising, towns and cities were expanding, and trade and agriculture flourishing. So all in all, it was a time of prosperity for many, when life was good. The chapter house, however, was built at the tail end of this auspicious period, perhaps the calm before the storm, you might say, as the 1290s began to see the first tentative signs that centuries of sustained economic growth was about to falter and things were set to change dramatically, not least in the form of the Great Famine, just five years after the construction of the chapter house, and later, of course, by the bubonic plague. However, the effects of those calamitous years were yet to be felt. So what can we learn of everyday life from the chapter house? The array of stone carvings certainly provides us with many tantalizing clues which help us to travel back some 730 years. So let's have a look at some, shall we? Whoa, well, certainly this is a couple of very interesting characters. So who might they be? Well, the carving on the left, as you can see, is a crowned head. It surely must be that of Edward I. His, his long reign lasted 35 years, so giving the country plenty of time to get used to him. So I think it goes without saying that the Masons would have wanted to include a carving of their king. After all, Edward was an ideal king in medieval terms, a man of enormous physical presence, standing six foot two inches tall, he must surely have towered over everyone around him at the time. He was an able statesman, administrator, soldier for sure, and a man of religious conviction. A, a king perhaps not loved by his countrymen, but certainly respected and feared. News of his battles with the Welsh in the marches and the Scots to the north would have been fresh in the minds of many people at the time. Local men may conceivably have been recruited for his battles, such as Stirling Bridge, for instance, which raged in 1298, and Falkirk the following year. Furthermore, it seems that Edward was a frequent visitor to this area. In 1290, it's well documented that he convened Parliament at Clipston, which is a mere 13 miles from the Minster. And sadly, a month later, his wife of 36 years, Eleanor of Castile, the lady of the famous Eleanor Crosses, died at the nearby village of Harby. Looking to the carving on the right, this very distinguished looking man with his extraordinary moustache surely must represent the master mason wearing his familiar mason's headwear. Again, a likely choice of subject uh, and why ever not? Master masons were elite craftsmen cleverly combining the skills of architect, designer, builder and engineer. They were well educated in their skill and well paid. It's little wonder that many people at the time thought they were magicians. Coming on now to religion. Well, as we know, England at the time was a Roman Catholic country and the church provided for all the religious aspects of people's lives right the way through from baptism to the last rites. The monasteries and nunneries looked after the old and the sick and paid alms for the poor. Religion for most was a profoundly important part of everyday life. They feared for their immortal soul and regularly attended very lengthy services. The archbishops and bishops and 
There are four in all mitred heads uh, in the chapter house and through into the passageway or slype. These men belong to the nobility. They lived a life of luxury with power and prestige. They could raise an army for the king in times of war, attend the king's council and sit in the House of Lords. The prebendaries or secular canons who were allocated specific seats within the chapter house are an integral part of its story. And as such, they warrant far more detail than I have time to give today in this short talk. Suffice to say that they were responsible for the everyday running of the minster, they were answerable to the archbishops and bishops, and they represented various parishes from which they drew their income. Religious affiliation was taken very seriously in the Middle Ages, and people were much more likely to be discriminated against according to their religion than their ethnicity, with the Cathars, heretics and the Jews being amongst those who suffer greatly. And that brings me on to the next, our next section, anti-Semitism. This carving is full of charisma, even the cobwebs. He smiles down so engagingly from the top of the archway. He may or may not represent a Jewish man, although he does seem to have rather Hebrew features. Antisemitism, with its one epicenter in nearby Lincoln, had been on the rise for some 200 years, culminating in 1290 with Edward's Edict of Expulsion whereby the entire Jewish population, some 3,000 Jews, were expelled from the country. They left with nothing and did not return for some 350 years and on the invitation of Oliver Cromwell. Jews were the medieval moneylenders, sometimes charging extortionate rates of interest, a practice known as usury which had long been forbidden by the Catholic Church. There have been many suggestions that Jewish loans may have helped finance the building of the chapter house, although it's far from certain. But if that is the case, it might just be the reason that he's smiling. Mythical creatures and medieval superstitions well, certainly we know that medieval people were very superstitious, believing in all sorts of supernatural and mystical elements. Mythical creatures were seen as symbols of evil. Possibly the basilisk on the left is a wonderful example with this blinding stare hatched impossibly from a cockerel's egg and nurtured by a snake. It's little wonder they were feared. And the dragon on the right, breathing fire and able to poison wells and streams. Although there's nothing much to fear from this one because he seems to have lost his head. This unique carving features two menacing creatures, intertwined and skulking in the leaves. If you look carefully, you'll see that each has a pair of legs, long ears and really quite distinct facial features. Most of those features are not apparent from a distance. You need to be close up to this carving to see all the detail that there is in it. Is it possible that medieval people believed in the literal existence of these terrifying creatures? Or was it a way of simply making sense of their world to explain the inexplicable perhaps? We don't know. We may never know for sure. But 
here we have the lovely thinking merman stroking his chin as if deep in thought. He must surely represent something good and harmless, wholesome even, or simply the medieval philosophy that whatever existed on land had its counterpart in the sea. A beautiful carving full of character and charm. Coming on now to jobs and livelihoods, and I love this illustration. It really gives a real sense of medieval feudal farming. And of course, this would have been a very familiar sight in those days, bearing in mind that the majority of the population at the time lived in the countryside and 80% of them were peasants whose whole lives revolved around the agrarian calendar, producing food, wool and fuel. Interestingly, the period fell within the medieval warm period, which saw global temperatures rise by an estimated 0.5 degrees centigrade, a topic which is very much on our minds today. Milder winters with reliably wet summers, together with the three field system of crop rotation, of course, greatly improved food production. Well, the carving on the left is literally a hidden gem. It takes a very observant visitor to spot the two hungry pigs hiding under the capital, feasting on acorns and above amongst the leaves. If you look very carefully, there is an empty cupule. Such detail. Pigs, of course, were kept at the time. They were prolific and needed very little care. Panage, the right to graze pigs in the forests, was easily available in the villages of Sherwood Forest, which extended far further then than it does today, making the villages of Woodborough, Loudham and Gedling good local examples. Pigs were turned out to roam freely in the forest from September to November to fatten up on acorns before slaughter. This had, of course, the added advantage of clearing the forest floor from the green acorns, which were toxic to ponies, cattle and deer. Deer, of course, being regularly hunted in the royal forests. Sheep were kept in abundance. In fact, wool was the backbone and driving force of the economy at the time and often referred to as the jewel in the realm. The carving on the right is um, something of a mystery and we're not quite sure whether it's a, a monkey or even a, a, a ram, but either way, both were kept. We know that goats were also kept. The ancient Nottinghamshire village of Goatham derives its name from the Old English for goat home. Notice the detail in this carving. The masons have really captured those strange slanted eyes that goats have to increase their field of vision and the narrow horizontal pupils that help grazing animals avoid predation. Makes you wonder if the Masons actually knew that at the time. I suspect they did. Notice the goat herd sounding his horn and regulating the volume or pitch with his four fingers. He's sitting cross legs and look at his little feet. They're just adorable. For me, this carving has a lovely warmth to it. It's truly magical. Uh, coming on to fishing now, and we have some more of these very interesting illustrations. I love them. The consumption of fish was an important part of, of life. Not only the catching, but only also the preparation, storage, transportation and cooking. 
Eels were a staple food at the time. Silver eel fishing was common in the communities living alongside rivers. The migration of these eels is a predictable annual event, which is thought to be well understood by fishermen working along the Trent. Surprisingly, eels were not only a nutritious form of food, but they were an acceptable and often preferable form of rent. In fact, rent eels, as, uh, it's, sorry, eel rents, as they were called at the time, were often commonplace, especially when the available coinage was in short supply. Silver eels, with their amazing life cycle, are now sadly a critically endangered species. Very sad. Coming on next to mining uh, and some more of these lovely illustrations. I, I think they're great. On the left, we have mining um, of iron, lead and tin. And later, of course, coal, particularly in Nottinghamshire. These prov provided jobs for many people. In fact, the industry was booming at this time to meet the extreme demand for metal, for construction, and, and of course, for fuel. And on the right shows us stone qu quarrying, which also created much employment, notably in Mansfield, as mentioned recently by Professor Dixon in his talk, providing stone for the minster. Coming on now to recreational activities, and I have to say that it's hard to imagine that there was much time in those days for leisure activities. However, it would seem that there was no shortage of entertainment with church and saint days, banquets and jousts, hunting, as we can see in this very explicit carving with the hare at the centre, flanked by the, the two hounds. Lovely. Games and sports were popular, including an early form of football and a more unseemly baiting of dogs, bears and even monkeys. Very grim. Archery tournaments were popular and it was not just a sport, it became mandatory, in fact, for young peasant boys to practice for at least two hours every Sunday. Maypole dancing, as was a regular May Day event, celebrating the return of spring, with young girls wearing floral garlands and crowning a May king and queen. The celebration is thought to have been a pagan rite subsequently adopted by Christianity. It's a lovely example on the left of a May Blossom garland on that young lady. Itinerant performing troops were popular. Acrobats, jugglers and troubadours reciting poems of courtly love and minstrels who played a variety of instruments and were well paid. It seems that women and young girls play tambourines, which brings me to the carving, a very interesting carving on the right. Could that lady be holding a tambourine? Although a brooch has been suggested, but I rather like to think it's a tambourine. And if all that entertainment wasn't enough, well, you could always call into the nearby pub and there were plenty of them. In those days, of course, they were called ale houses, which, as the name suggests, served only ale. Or the tavern, with the added dist distinction of serving not only ale, but wine, which was much more expensive, and food. Well, if leisure time was short, I certainly have to say that medieval people certainly made the most of it. Well, I'm afraid that's all I have time for today, but I would like to leave you with an interesting thought. 1290, along with everything else that was happening in that remarkable year, 
saw the first year of Goose Fair in Nottingham, and as we know, it's thrived ever since. It's now my great pleasure to pass you over to Janet, who will share with us her amazing insight into the natural history so beautifully illustrated in the chapter house. Thank you. Many, Many thanks. thanks. Many, Many thanks, thanks Joanne. Joanne. Having heard about the social and cultural history at the time the chapter house was built, and being introduced to some of its wonderful carvings, I'd like to spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the world famous Leaves of Southall or Southwell, a term first coined by Sir Nicholas Pevsner in 1945. These are widely acknowledged as the finest examples of 13th century naturalistic carving in the UK, if not worldwide. And we were incredibly fortunate that the building of our chapter house coincided with this short architectural period, which only lasted about 70 years until around 1310. This style was initially developed on the continent, as evident from the magnificent carvings that can still be seen in Naumburg and Rheem Cathedral. And it represented a stark contrast to the austerity of the Cistercian abbeys in the 12th century, where such decoration and flamboyance would have been considered frankly heretical. Appreciation of the beauty of nature as an integral part of worship and the subsequent development of naturalistic carving was undoubtedly influenced by the work of the famous 12th century abbess Hildegard of Bingen. She studied the healing properties of plants, and they were also influenced by a great cleric and naturalist, Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great, during the 13th century, who described trees and plants not simply um, from a classical angle, as, as had been done previously, but based on his own powers of observation, a skill that the medieval masons then readily adopted. Now, some of the best examples of the various leaves found within the chapter house itself can be found around this magnificent archway entrance, where one can stand and stare in wonder at the skill and imagination of those ancient masons. If we take a closer look at the entrance archway, surely the work of the master mason or carver. On the left of this slide, you will see that the capitals topping each column or pillar of Hopton wood stone, which is a local Derbyshire limestone, you will see that they're adorned with an astonishing array of leaves. From um, left to right, you see the vine, hawthorn, maple and buttercup, with a headless dragon that Joanne referred to lurking amongst the maple leaves as the carvings continue their way up through the inner archway towards the roof. On the right, buttercups can be seen creeping around the central pillar, while hawthorn leaves climb above. And I'd just like to point out that if you're trying to identify these leaf carvings, it's important to remember that while they are incredibly lifelike, they aren't carved to, uh, to scale, such that a hawthorn leaf sometimes appears to be as large as a vine or a maple leaf. The sense of wonder at the beauty and skill displayed by these 700 year old carvings increases further on noting that the magnificent capitals on either side of this archway are carved from one continuous stone block with the leaves of several species such as the buttercup, vine and oak shown here overlapping just as they would in nature. One does wonder how many blocks had to be discarded before such perfection could be achieved with its incredible undercutting across the entire block. The wonderful thing about these carvings is that the more one looks, the more one sees. And if we follow the vine leaves around the outer edge of the um, entrance arch towards the apex, you can see someone collecting grapes into a basket, illustrating not only the skill, but the imagination of these masons and their ability to tell stories in stone 
and evoke curiosity centuries later. Over 16 different types of leaves have been identified within the chapter house, with some, such as the maple, vine and hawthorn, appearing more frequently than others. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why these were chosen from a possible selection of over a thousand at the time. It is, however, worth noting that all the species that can be found in our chapter house can still be collected from the hedgerows and woodlands within a mile of the minster, and all are either palmate, in other words, hand-shaped, or they're climbing, such as bryony, rose and ivy, suggesting that irrespective of any religious symbolism or medicinal value, they were also selected for their decorative value and the way in which they would reflect light and shadow when carved in stone. Once through the archway and into the chapter house itself, the sense of wonder and space continues. Each arcaded seat where the prebendaries used to sit is surrounded by a richly decorated capital, abacus, springing arch and tympanum, these triangular shaped um, uh, places above each seat. And this view can be so captivating that some visitors never raise their glass glance upwards. Indeed, when calculating the relative frequency with which the various leaves are represented, most publications have limited their reports to those which can be seen at eye level, as shown here. However, this risks missing one of the most outstanding features of our chapter house, that of our magnificent unsupported stone vaulted roof, the only one in the country and a true architectural wonder, supported purely by the external buttresses that Philip Dixon described in one of these talks a month ago. The leaf carvings continue right up to the boss in the centre of the ceiling, but now they be, appear in a more repetitive wallpaper style, lacking the flamboyance and flow, flowing of those below. And this probably indicates that being the last part of the chapter house to be completed, this reflects the change of style towards the end of the naturalistic period um, into this more what we would call a wallpaper style used for covering vast swathes of stonework um, later on. By glancing upwards, one also begins to appreciate what a rich upper canopy we have in the chapter house, and also the fact that these masons took an amazing pride in their work, even when it was not clearly visible on a day-to-day -day basis. Here are just a few of the hidden gems from that upper canopy, including the goat that Joanne's just highlighted, um, but and it, I think you can see the detail, especially with the carving of the oak rising from someone's head on the right hand side, the beautiful acorns within um, their acorn cupules. These were sort of invisible to the naked eye from on ground level, um, and it shows just how difficult it is to say how many of each leaf is present and indeed what all the species that are represented. But one of the great advantages of the current leaves project is that with the enhanced lighting that has now been installed, such carvings will be far more visible from ground level in future. So let's take a look at some of these leaves in more detail. Now, I'm not going to attempt to discuss all of the species that can be seen, especially as full details of these will be available once the chapter house is reopened in the summer. And that will be in the form of a new guidebook, illustrated paddles and various educational resources that will be um, in the redesigned Archbishop's Garden. So we're going to start with the oak, um, perhaps one of our most easily recognisable leaves. And within, within the chapter house, you see both sessile, um, where the acorns grow very close and tightly against the leaves, and pedunculated oaks, where the acorns hang from little stems like miniature pipes. Both, both forms are, sh are shown in the chapter house. Now, this tree would have been a natural choice for the Masons, since not only were oaks highly prevalent at the time, some being 
on the very close to the mighty oaks in the royal hunting ground of Sherwood Forest and a reminder of their local folk hero, Robin Hood. But they provided highly decorative material with respect to leaf shape, pronounced veins which reflect light and shade and a wide variety of features such as acorns and galls, um, all of which are represented in stone. In many cultures, the oak has always symbolized strength, power, wisdom, life protection and success. And many of our ancient kings wore a crown of oak leaves, as did the Roman commanders during victory festivals. The monarch's head is still shown with a wreath of oak on Maundy money. And until very recently, an oak tree could be found engraved on the reverse of our one pound coin. The oak also had many medicinal uses due to its anti-inflammatory, its astringent and antiseptic properties and was used in the treatment of dysentery, cholera and as a diuretic. With England being an island, the main use of oak in the Middle Ages was for boat and shipbuilding and the term hearts of oak conveys a sense of centuries old debt to the English Navy, which protected an island kingdom from invasion. The galls found on oak leaves were used commercially to make gallic and tannic acid um, for dyeing and tanning, and they were also used for making ink. And we see this wonderful carving again, which illustrates that the oak was not only a useful food source with respect to the truffles and mushrooms which grew near, near its roots, but of course for the supply of acorns. And this carving um, is a great favourite with our visitors because it really does illustrate medieval humour. Joanne's already mentioned that it's, they are very well hidden and certainly they cannot be seen at eye level, uh, only indicated by the empty acorn. You've got to sit on one of the seats of the, of the prebendaries and look up in order to actually see them. And one does wonder whether these were carved specifically to amuse one of the canons during a particularly boring business meeting of the chapter. The carvings of buttercups are equally decorative and they are detailed to such an extent that you can almost visualise the pollen at the end of the stamens in the centre of each flower. Again, much symbolism has been associated with buttercups especially with respect to its colours, with yellow for new beginnings, joy, happiness and friendship, and their green inner colour for optimism, renewal, good fortune, health and youth. Medicinally, the creeping variety is an analgesic or painkiller, and it's been used as a ruby patient, reddening the skin by topically increasing blood supply. Historically, it's been used to relieve muscular pain, gout, arthritis, rheumatism, but also warts and shingles. However, the use of ruby patients is no longer supported by the NHS, and it is important to remember that these plants can be extremely toxic. One of my favourite leaves in the chapter house is the maple or acer. And of course, our sycamore is um, closely uh, related family. And I love the way that the winged fruits that children so love to flutter down as little helicopters are, are shown so beautifully um, in the carvings. Uh, maple thrives well in wet boggy areas such as Southwell with its numerous springs and, and rivers. The maple trees are, so, are sometimes referred to as Whistler's Wood because children used it to make whistles. And Joanne has already referred to the superstitious beliefs in medieval times and several of the plants within the chapter house, including maple, wormwood, bryony and ivy, were all believed to have apopatraic properties. In other words, the ability to avert evil influences or bad luck. Indeed, sprigs of such plants were often hung on doorways to repel demons and evil spirits. Medicinally, maple was used to relieve toothache, as is amusingly illustrated in the chapter house passageway by a carving of maple immediately above a man whose face is wrapped in a bandage and who was obviously suffering from severe toothache at the time. 
In addition, maple leaf poultices were used to bathe sore eyes, while maple bark tea infusion was used for kidney infections, colds and bronchitis. The frequent carvings of vine have been cause for much speculation, including, of course, their potential link to biblical references. Jesus metaphorically referred to himself as the true vine and his followers as the branches. But additional symbolism and medicinal uses date back for thousands of years. Wine has been mixed with medicinal herbs for over 5000 years and in 400 BCE, Hippocrates is said to have cured his intestinal worms using his own wine based remedy, some sort of early vermouth, perhaps. Vine grows opportunistically, digging in to gain a strong foothold for survival. And to the Celts, it indicated connectivity, eternity, tenacity and diversity because of its ability to branch and expand in new directions. Medicinally, alcohol was seen as important in the Middle Ages, being recognised not only as a relaxation aid and antiseptic, but often safer to drink than the local water. Ivy, which is both palmate and a climber, is sometimes referred to as God's footprints, as it is evergreen and is found everywhere. It can grow in the harshest of conditions and is synonymous with strength and tenacity. And being evergreen, it symbolizes eternity, faithfulness and friendship. In extract form, it has been used medicinally for topical balms, lotions, shampoos, and cosmetics, including anti-cellulite creams. Traditional folk music, sorry, traditional folk medicine used ivy for disorders of liver and spleen, as well as for gout, arthritis, rheumatism and dysentery, while bronchitis formulae containing ivy leaf was used to alleviate respiratory problems. However, despite its very rich herbal history, most of ivy's uses have been gradually forgotten over the years. Now, symbolically, the rose was a pre-Christian icon of the ancient Roman goddess Venus, and even today, it remains a symbol of love and passion, as well as being the national flower of England. In Christianity, the rose represents heaven and harmony in the world and is one of the flowers associated with the Virgin Mary. We've only got a few examples of the rose in the chapter house, but amongst these is the double rose as shown in the carving on the left. And that's interesting because the rose has long been a common heraldic symbol denoting nobility and Edward I, whom Joanne mentioned as reigning at the time this chapter house was built, adopted the golden rose device seen here from his mother, Eleanor of Provence. And finally, amongst the leaves that we have time to discuss today, we turn to the hawthorn, of which innumerable examples are to be found. Since hawthorn thrives well with a constant water supply and moist soil, Southwell in the Middle Ages was an ideal habitat. Hawthorn was the cornerstone of pagan culture, was revered by the Celts and Druids, and to this day it symbolises the arrival of spring. Being full of contradictions, such as the beautiful blossoms nestled amongst lethal looking thorns, Hawthorn is also considered to represent duality and the union of opposites. Many cultures regard the Hawthorn tree as the guardian of springs and wells, highly relevant when you appreciate that our current chapter house is built so close to one such spring. Many spells and potions used Hawthorn for fertility and good luck, especially when relating, related to fishing, a common occupation in Southall in medieval times due to the proximity of the rivers Greet and Trent. We can find examples of Hawthorn throughout the entire chapter house, representing it throughout the seasons, including many carvings with berries as are seen to adorn our hedgerows during the autumn. These berries have been used to treat heart conditions since the first century, and they're also used to treat blood pressure irregularities, arrhythmias, high cholesterol levels, and as a sedative. 
It has also been suggested that the crown of thorns placed on Christ's head at the time of the crucifixion may have been made from hawthorns. Now, many of the leaves that can be spotted in the chapter house are an integral part of more complex carvings, such as those including the green men or foliate faces, which were the subject of a talk by Cassie Harrington a fortnight ago. Ten of these can be found in the chapter house, the one here in the triangular tympanum being surrounded by hawthorn. Now, although originally thought to be adopted from pagan cultures, there is now evidence that foliate faces may have a Christian origin. And in this context, they are often thought to symbolize rebirth, God's word spilling forth, and or very importantly, our own intimate connection with the natural world. In addition to the rose seen on the left and the buttercup on the right, which I've already discussed, the central uh, carving here shows hop and strawberry glowing, growing in close uh, ju juxtaposition, perhaps reflecting the fact that life can be both bitter and sweet simultaneously. Now, all of the foliate faces I've shown you so far have been within, have been within these tympanum, but sometimes you have to look a little closer in your hunt. And here we see on the left, um, a face surrounded by ivy leaves on a springing arch, and on the right, a beautiful carving, which could just be a rare example of one of the female foliate faces surrounded by hawthorn. Well, in order to allow plenty of time for questions, I'm going to finish here, but by reminding you of the wonderful plethora of uh, carvings that also adorn the slipe or passageway leading into the chapter house. But I would encourage you, even if you've been frequent visitors to the chapter house in the past, do return once the conservation work has been completed in the summer and just stand and stare once more in awe at the incredible medieval leaves of Southwell. And while waiting for that moment, you could do worse than just step outside into our wonderful countryside this spring. Use your own powers of observation just as those medieval masons did, to stand in awe of the ever-changing beauty of the natural world and simply listen to the leaves. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joanne and Janet. I've, um, I've taken loads of notes. <laughs> So thank you very much. Really interesting insight into medieval life there and a close look at our beautiful chapter house. Um, one or two of us were lucky enough to have a sneaky preview the other day. Um, we went down uh, to have a look and the scaffolding's gone, the carvings are unwrapped, the big wooden plinth heater things have gone. It's really exciting time uh, to be around actually at the Minster. It's just a shame that uh, we, it's still closed, but it won't be long till we can have visitors again. Um, if anybody would like to ask questions, I know there's one, one or two in the chat already, then please either pop them in the chat, which Eliza's monitoring, or use the hand up icon on the bar at the top. Um, there's a, a face and a hand, and if you click on it and put the hand up, it will highlight you and I'll be able to see if you have a question to ask. But as there's one already in the chat, Eliza, shall we start with that one? Yes, we have a question from uh, Hilary. Uh, firstly for uh, Joanne, I think. So uh, it's about the funding of the construction. So um, Hilary says, I had thought that the arrangement was for the prebendaries to each pay a levy for construction because the archbishop had to get involved when some of them didn't. Is this correct? Mute. <laughs> Joanne, so yeah, you're muted. Mute. <laughs> <laughs> so easily done. Can you hear me now? <laughs> um, as far as the prebendaries were concerned, I think possibly Janet could, might be able to answer that side of it better. Um, th there have been many suggestions that um, Jewish funds may well have been 
uh, involved in the original construction. Um, I personally wouldn't think so. I think it's highly unlikely, um, certainly by the fact that at that time, most of the lending institutions were uh, in Italy with the, um, the big Italian financing money lenders at that time. As far as the prebendaries are concerned, uh, I think Janet could probably explain that a little better than I. Hmm. Well, well, certainly I think that there was quite a lot of correspondence going on between York and the, um, the prebendaries. Um, I think they were told off some of them for not contributing. Uh, this, the chapter house was built really as a, a bit of a it was a show a showcase really for the archbishop and and it was a time when everything had to be bigger better more beautiful and i think some of the canons and the, certainly the the canons or prebendaries at the time they were quite a mixed bag um they didn't always have a huge uh, affiliation i think it was very nice for them to have the title and it was very lovely for them to have the grounds and the houses um but they weren't always present and they sometimes sublet um and made a profit themselves and i do think they had to be harassed a bit by the bishop in order to come up with the funds um you know i think at times the it was threatened that if they didn't pay up then their houses would you know they wouldn't be allowed to get rent from their houses so there was certainly that aspect with them being asked to contribute to the building of the chapter house um even if some funds were obtained from elsewhere thank you very much um i'm going to go to the hands up and patricia um, has a hand up. So Patricia, if you'd like to unmute yourself and if you'd like to turn your camera off, then we camera on, I mean, then we can see you. That would be nice. <laughs> Sorry, I wouldn't ask anyone to turn that camera off. <laughs> right, I have a go at that. Um, probably you can see me now. We can, can see you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to say a couple of things. Firstly, um, superb superb talk and it makes me long to get back to stewarding as we once knew it and i'm really hanging on to that hope um but you've rekindled um not that i ever lost it the love of the minster and in particular the chapter house and uh, a fabulous a fabulous talk um just to say to joanne about the eels um in the talk that um, Professor Philip Dixon gave, uh, I asked him a question um, relating to the River Morn, which flows just within a mile of where I live in West Drayton. Just after that river, just a few hundred yards after that river, is a very old farm and it's called Eel Pie Farm. And the road that goes through my village is the old London Road and um, it's always been known locally that of course the travellers came down the old London Road um, on their way to Lincoln and would stop at Eel Pie Farm where they would buy or partake of the pies made there uh, on their way to London. So oh I'm really thrilled to be able to share that. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you yes. very much, Pat. And, and lastly, to Diana and her team, um, yeah, thank you for bringing these talks to us and making it so easy and accessible. Well, thank you very much, Patricia. We've had an absolute ball doing it, actually. It's been wonderful. Um, so if we go to the chat with Eliza, if she's there, she was going to ask her dad to yes. talk a bit more quietly. I don't know if she's back. I'm back. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I've got a second question from Hilary, which I think we'll have time to um, to talk about. So secondly, this is for Janet. Um, she says there's this idea floating around that the late 13th century naturalism reflected the introduction of Aristotle into European universities in this period. His emphasis was on observation rather than theoretical constructs. Would love to know if you had any thoughts on this. Wow. Um, I, I think that, well, as I said, I already, already mentioned um, uh, 
the influence of um, uh, Albertus, you know, uh, Magnus, as as well as Hildenberg, uh, Bingham. But I think Aristotle, it's certainly been said that all of these people, there was this this movement that um, just just how vividly people could observe and look, and it was no longer static. And one of the very interesting things about the old um, botanical books is they very rarely illustrated. Um, they wrote about the plants, but they very rarely drew them because they were ever changing. And I think that's really interesting. And if you look at it, and in, whether you look at a, a book of wildflowers or, or birds, often you don't see what you're actually looking at because it's in a different posture or it's a different time of the year. And I think that this this use of, of being able to display um, the powers of observation are incredible. And I, I, I think possibly that's why I totally fell in love with the chapter house because it makes you stop and stare. You, you, you can't just walk in there and walk out again. And you, you can really, really, it's, it's mindful looking is just incredible when you go in there. So I, I'm sure that Aristotle also did have that influence, absolutely, yeah. Um. Thank you, Janet. Joanne, do you have anything to add to that or not? Sorry. Um, no. Can I? Um, I don't think I'm. Can I? Can I ask a question? Can you see me? Hello. Uh, yes, we can see you. Yes. <laughs> May I ask a question? Uh, yes, please do. Yeah, I just wonder if you have any information about the shield and the gig that you have. Um, I d I'm only just discovered they have one i've only been twice to southwell it's, it's on my list to come again um fascinating absolutely fascinating but i didn't know you'd got a shill in a gig um i just wondered when you found out and if you realize just how significant it is well it's not actually in the chapter house which is why we haven't covered it today. oh i see right yes it's in, mm. no it's in the choir interestingly enough um so we can't really cover that today because this was more about the ah, yes. <laughs> but when yeah. it opens up again and the verges do love talking about it so oh, <laughs> that's, oh, that's wonderful because yeah so many churches when i mention uh, have you got one you know i, I get a blank stare back and it, and it, i know there's a lot of research being done on it yeah and it's a fascinating area yeah we, we've definitely got one but not in the chapter house <laughs> okay thank you there is actually one on the the west facade as well of on the outside of the minster but it's so high up at the top that very few people can actually see it it, that's the one i've read about and i know that they moved a lot um because the, the belief is one of them that they are of pagan origin and um but they, they were placed um, with christianity in churches but in a very prominent position um they one of the stories is the lust theory I, I tend to go for the fact that so many women lost their lives in childbirth yeah. um it was more to do with that and also i wondered about the link with the um the green men but with the the holding the mouths open in very much the same way as the uh, women with the vulva sort of stolen the women's um i just wonder there's lo so much in there and it's sort of all hidden away um but thank you for your talk I'm fascinated about the leaves yeah <laughs> yes well you're quite right there is a lot of research going into certainly the sheila and the gig one um because they're popping up all all over the place and and uh, i think it would be very interesting to know more about them mm -hmm certainly their origin but thank you for for your comment thank you as you say there's always so much to uh learn isn't there now i've just seen a comment here um it's from some mb by the way when did we stop calling southwell southall i think <laughs> um, those of us who live in southwell call it southwell those of us who don't live in Southern and listen to Radio 4 call it Southern. And those of us who live in one place and work in Southwell call it a bit of both. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. I'm not <laughs> sure what the answer is. Um, I, Eliza, I understand I think, that the BBC says Southern. So. Yes, I think they do. They talk about Southern races, don't they? It's a, it'll never, we'll never resolve that one. Uh, El Eliza, I think we've got time for one more question. Was the one about the paint? Yes. Um, Gillian says, 
I'm assuming that the sculptures were originally brightly painted, as was normal in medieval times. Would either speaker like to say anything about this? Well, I think it's for, certainly the chapter house uh, originally would have been considerably more colourful than it, than it is today. Um, there's a lot of investigation going on about that, but uh, I'm afraid it's not uh, it's not my area of expertise. Perhaps Janet can um, say a little bit more about it. Well, certainly there was a talk. In fact, if somebody wants to go back a couple of, uh, I don't know how many weeks, this might be six weeks now, I'm losing track, but on Raman spectroscopy um, and lots of samples have been taken. Um, there is no doubt that paint was used uh, originally um, and over the years it's either been whitewashed as it would have been during the Civil War, it's been cleaned rather aggressively by the Victorians um, and the amount of evidence that remains is, is scant. What was interesting from the talk we heard was we've always imagined it was a bit like walking into a woodland or a garden and it would have been sort of greens and all the rest of it but the predominant colours that have been found in there are more the reds and browns and yellows, the earth pigments. Um, now that may just be because they are more durable and uh, the green was in particular um, is more likely to have suffered from over cleaning and, and whatever. So we can definitely say colour was used, um, but we can't be absolutely certain as to you know, how it was distributed because we may have lost some of those pigments. There's another analysis going on currently where um, samples have been taken from the upper canopy in, in the hopes that they haven't been cleaned quite so vigorously as the ones below. But yeah, paint would have been used throughout the Minster um, uh, at the time. Yes, there's lo lots of pigments. I think it's an interesting question because um, a, a lot of people tend to have the impression that um, the medievals were rather dull in colour, but in actual fact that it couldn't be far from the case. Um, we may not see it in, in ancient buildings because, as Janet said, the, the minster, the chapter house in the minster is much like other uh, medieval buildings in, in that it's either worn off through the ravages of time and one thing and another. But we can see their love uh, of colour in, in their manuscripts, in ancient manuscripts where the marginalia, for example, is, is a riot of colour and their illustrations are too. So they certainly were not dull in that sense. And I think Janet um, mentioned that we had a talk a few weeks ago from Professor Brooke, who's been doing the Raman spectroscopy work. He's taken some more samples from the upper level. The chapter house was scaffolded a couple of weeks ago and they were able to actually get up to some of the high carvings. So that's ongoing. But if you are interested in hearing Chris's talk, it's not available widely on YouTube. Uh, but we can share the link to the talk with you. If you email Aoife, she will be able to send you the link to that. Now I can see Victoria has a hand up. Um, so I'm going to invite her to unmute and speak. If it's the Victoria, I think it is. She's probably got something to add to that. Yeah, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Victoria, yes. Well, this time I did unmute myself. Brilliant ladies. I knew it would be and it was absolutely fantastic. I could listen to the pair of you all afternoon. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> so I could. You, Victoria. <laughs> I could just learn something new about the chapter house every time I go in with Janet and Jo. It's, it's amazing. Um, the paint, the, there is a slight rethink that the red may have been used as a base colour. But that is ongoing with a bit more investigation so it might not have been as red as Chris thought it had been to begin with although um, if you remember when Cassie gave her talk about the foliot men she said instead of being green they often tended to be red and yellow colours so I think the red was quite predominant but it wasn't perhaps as overwhelming as we thought it might have been at first Right. And if you look around carefully in the minster, you will see little bits of paint elsewhere. I won't tell you where, you'll have to go and have a look. 
we can do a just some hold some time, Victor. The most. <laughs> Thank you. I thought you might have something to add to that. So I know you've been involved in taking some of the samples, haven't you? Yeah, it was um, it was rather sad. I mean, Janet was saying looking for samples that um, higher up. Unfortunately, they cleaned it almost as well as down below. They took acid to it, which is why the surface of the stone is quite pitted in places. Um, but there were one or two intriguing bits that we will get more, more idea of the colour from. Thank you. I think. But I learned such a lot this afternoon. It was brilliant. <laughs> I think <laughs> we all did. It was wonderful, really wonderful. Um, as with with all of our talks, apart from one or two of them, for various reasons, can't be made public. And um, it will be on YouTube, so you will be able to listen again. I'm going to go back through and fill in all my gaps in my notes. <laughs> But I just want to say a huge thank you for attending today and thank you again for your donations, which, as I was saying at the beginning, if you missed it, are going straight to uh, improvements in the garden, which is wonderful. So Aoife is going to be emailing an evaluation form to you all. We do read them all, only take about five minutes to fill in. So please, please do uh, fill them in. It's very helpful. We're taking a short Easter break in the talks, but our next one is on the 20th of April and we're going to be joined by James Wright, who I'm told is an award winning archaeologist um, and he's going to be exploring medieval sculpture and using a variety of case studies, including the Minster, but also Tattershall Castle and Norwich Cathedral. I'd also just like to say a really big thank you to um, the education team who have put these talks together. I feel I get a lot of the credit for it, but actually Aoife has done a huge amount of work in setting each and every talk up and trying to give people who are having tech trouble personal attention to get in. So thank you Aoife and also our colleague Helen who couldn't be here today. She was a she was um, she had to actually be in the chapter house, lucky lady. Uh, but she's also found uh, uh, arranged some of the talks as well. So it's been a real team effort. So we're looking forward to you joining us again on the 20th of April. Um, and you can find out more information about that and book uh, on the website. It's available now. And obviously, thank you, Joanne. And thank you, Janet, for your uh, being with us this afternoon for your really interesting talk. We appreciate it hugely and obviously we must acknowledge the National Lottery Heritage Fund who provided the means for us to do all this wonderful work um, to the Chapter House. Um, so it's good to acknowledge them and enjoy Easter everybody and we hope to see you in April. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you.